okay. Wait for Marcel to give us a little bit more. You are live. Okay, Kevin, we're live, I believe. So um, I'd first like to say welcome to one more webinar from InfraSpeak. This is our series or initiative called Stay InfraSpeak. Every Thursday, we host a talk for maintenance and facility managers with topics related to operations, management, or technology with relevant industry professionals sharing their experience. If you want to keep that updated in our agenda, please follow the link that will be in the comments section. So access the comments and you'll get a link there. Without further ado, therefore, I'm going to start. We'll try and keep this to time today. So my name is Larry O'Brien. I'm the country manager for InfraSpeak, and I'm going to be host for today. That means I'm going to be guiding the conversations. And today we're going to be talking about um, the use of innovation and technology in the FM sector. Uh, please feel free to share insights, questions in the comments. We'll try and answer them either during this conversation or we will answer them after the conversation. Please remember the simple rules. There's no such thing as a stupid question. So uh, what I'd like to do first of all, before we get started, is introduce Kevin. It's Kevin McGuinness and he's from Trivalot. And Kevin, is you'd like to give a little bit of your background? That'd be lovely. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. My name is Kevin, as he said. I um, work for a Portuguese company called Trivalor. It's a business and facility services company uh, based wholly in Portugal. I'm not Portuguese myself, obviously. Um, but I have lived here for um, about 20 years. I'm from Ireland, from near Dublin, County Kildare. A um, bit about myself, my background, a professional background. I started out in um, consultancy, process re-engineering, SAP implementation, that kind of thing. Um, and after a couple of years, I moved into the telecom sector and I, was, I worked for, for Portugal Telecom there for, for many years in project management roles, mainly in the web area. Uh, customer care, things like that. And the last uh, couple of years, I was in, uh, I moved to innovation management, uh, pretty large and successful innovation management team that we have there going at that time. So uh, I, I did a few different things there. I was involved in many projects, uh, well, go to market solutions outside of telecom, or we consider telecom core, and also working with startups. Okay. Started, started engagement. Then after that, I moved to well, five years ago. I uh, was invited to go to Trivolor, this, this company, and set up their innovation program. Okay. So as I mean, as part of that, it's quite an interesting thing to be part of a large corporate organization and actually really build a startup program. Um, what made you think from your point of view that it would add value to Trivalor? And also, why would another corporate organization consider an innovation or startup program? Well, uh, they were considering an innovation program at the time uh, because they realized, I think correctly, that they needed to, to think about the future for the, the company or the group of companies for the future and um, startup engagement specifically, which is only one aspect of, of what I've done there. Uh, it's, it's a form of open innovation. So you know, it, it's, it's a really good way to get in contact with new ideas, um, with new business models, a new way of thinking and, um, and, 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 and collaborate you know, with, in a way that's successful for the, for the corporate entity and for the startup as well. So, you know that's the main that's the main reasoning behind it, the main motivation behind it. Okay, and that, I'm assuming from your point of view so far, it's been a successful experience with Trivalor. Could you, as part of that, have you got some kind of examples of the technologies you've adopted from these activities and why you followed up yeah. with them? Yeah. Um, well, to explain that, I think I, I would start kind of how we go about it, which kind of a clue to then to what kind of things we would adopt. So we start off with 
challenges, challenges that that are aligned with the uh, whatever the, the, the strategic objectives of the of the company assets can see through those strategic objectives. So we publish those challenges for the startups online and then get applications from from the startups to address those challenges with products or or, or technologies. It's not only technology driven; it's also Technology in terms of information technology, a lot of it is to do with also to do with, with new products, and um, we have challenges. Just to give you an example, some of the challenges we've published would be uh, general things like um, improving uh, the, the whole food process from from farm to fork, as we say. So improving uh, transparency, control uh, along that whole uh, value chain, um, safer people and assets. Uh, relating to the security area because we have a security company that's part of the, the group. Uh, customer engagement, employee engagement, obviously very important with large teams and streamlining processes. So um, we got the first year we did this, which was um, last year, we got, uh, we were very surprised with the positive response we got in terms of the number of applications and, and, and we got applications from all over the world. And we ended up selecting five Startups to do um, to pilot with, and they were um, one a Spanish company that had a plant-based uh, meat substitute, one of the things that's been widely talked about recently, and it's very in line with kind of new trends in in, in food and food consumption and, and customer customer tastes. Uh, so we, we 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 piloted with them and we moved almost straight away to a um, to a full-on commercial relationship with that, with that company that's called Sierra. Uh, Enterprise Bot, which is a chat bot and email bot uh, company, which is very important for kind of streamlining operations and, and reducing paper and, and automating simple processes. Uh, we have a, a pilot also with a Portuguese startup called Hectosense, and what they do is they use computer vision to improve um, CCT operations, CCTV operations in the security area. So detecting, you know, suspicious activity and things like that. And we also have a pilot that's to do with um, remote care of the elderly. So kind of a wide range of um, of solutions, technologies that we that we ended up choosing and, and piloting. And that was the first edition last year, and we're cur currently running the second edition. So you've started from the point of view of what are your your challenges, yeah. and then went out to the market as such to see the opportunities that can come up by working with startups to address those specific challenges. Exactly. exactly. So you're just you're effectively trying to bring some out of the box thinking into what's going on, and yeah. by yeah. pointing it to that wider audience, getting a more mm -hmm. collaborative approach. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no. I mean, people, corporates know that you know that they can't have all the ideas themselves, and that. And there's a difficulty sometimes in, in generating new ideas in a closed circuit. So um, collaborating with startups or universities or, or other, other kind of entities in the innovation ecosystem has that advantage. And startups, you know, they're so focused on, uh, on, on building a product and, and, and addressing a particular customer segment. You know, that's, that's, it's a win-win situation. Okay. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, because of the fact that you've went on that large corporate dealing with a startup, obviously there's a certain potential culture, a culture clash that you're going to get in that. And I mean, I know you've written an article about it because I mm. took the liberty of going to your LinkedIn page and uh, reading it. Nice picture of the bridge in the background, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and read your piece there. And I think we're going to be posting a link to that in the comments. But what are the main kind of challenges that you came across during this process of mm -hmm. you know corporate and startup and how have you managed to overcome those um there's a lot of hurdles and, and things that come up um because there definitely is a culture clash there's a different way of thinking there's a different way of doing things mm -hmm. on the one hand you have um the startups they can get they can get frustrated with the kind of slow decision making process, which is the normal decision making process in any large uh, company. 
um, the, the the corporate on the corporate side, then it could be could also be frustration with some uh, kind of innocence or lack of operational know-how on the part of the of the startup, which is also completely normal. Um, and and you, you probably know yourself, corporates have a tendency to um, look at quarterly results and they want results quickly, and they're not really into risky projects. There's a low tolerance for failure and all these kind of things um, present hurdles to, to this kind of collaboration, this kind of program. Yeah. What can you do? What are we trying to do? First of all, I think it's really important in this kind of thing to, um, first of all, prepare well and align your, for example, the challenges that I, that I spoke about, um, the, the challenges that you're going to present to startups, align them with the strategic objectives of the corporate. So make sure you know that what you're looking for is 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 aligned in some way with what the the, the strategy of the of the corporate is. Um, then I think that, that that's that's essential. And then once you get into kind of pilot mode and, and, and implementing something, break it up into specific deliverables, make them easy to understand, easy to communicate within the, the corporate entity. Um, First, even uh, during that process, then make sure you have clear communication of how these deliverables are, are going. You know what's the implementation, what are the, what are the, key, the, 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 the KPIs that are being controlled, and, and kind of celebrate the small victories along the way. One thing that's very important, actually, before you get to that stage, is make sure you do a good triage of the uh, of the the applications that are coming in, because you can get inundated. Really, up to a certain point, inundated with applications, and you don't want to be passing all that on to corporate decision makers and all that kind of information. So make sure you have a, a team, a small team, like a very small team that's doing a triage of the of the startup uh, applications that are coming in, and select only the ones that you think actually are relevant, are aligned with strategic objectives, and are worth the corporate decision makers uh, spending time on. So I think if you do this preparation properly, and I think if you um, manage the pilot implementation in a way that suits both the startups and the corporates then you can then you can have success if you don't do that if you just go startups come come work with us and kind of pass on all that information to 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 people inside your company i think it's, it's not gonna work out so being basically what you're saying is go back and take a structured project management approach get focused yeah. break it up into bite-sized chunks make sure you've got alignment and then start out from there with really, really good, well-defined channels of communication, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Break it up into chunks. Yeah. You could call them work packages, but yeah, it's the it's yeah. that basic. I I understand where you're coming from entirely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, one of the interesting things I thought is that, you, from our point of view and where we come from, obviously a big part of Trivalor is your business and facility services. Mm -hmm. um, this might be contentious for some people, but one of the things we think is that there's still a lot of work to be done in what's quite a conservative area in terms of people looking at new technology and the adoption of new technology. What mm -hmm. do you think about this? What's your kind of experience in this? And really, how would you boost innovation or suggest that other people boost innovation amongst mm -hmm. their companies? Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, there's no doubt that it is, generally speaking, a, quite a conservative area of business. It's uh, highly labor intensive in general, uh, low margin, and um, it, 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 I mean, it can, and, and with large operations, that can be hard to make go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So you know, it is it is a huge challenge. Um, but first of all, it, it, it's good that there's, or if you, if you have awareness within the corporate entity that, you know, change is happening, customer tastes are, are changing, uh, people have, people expect to give immediate feedback, social media has kind of changed the way people interact with their, their service providers at all, at all levels, and they have different expectations these days. So, you know, based on, based only on that, if not other things, there's um, there's a lot 
there's a lot to be done. And, and it's whether that's kind of an awareness and a sense of urgency within the company. Okay, we, we need to do things a bit differently. Second of all, um, I would treat innovation as a process and not as some kind of black magic thing that can happen through you know great inspiration. It's a process. Uh, it's, and like any process, it has to be managed. So first of all, generate ideas in a structured way and get people involved in workshops, in idea competition, uh, present challenges to them, challenges that are once more based on you know strategic objectives or real real business problems that you have. Um, get so you know generate that kind of that, the the ideas within the, within the company, then pilot as much as possible to see what works and what doesn't work, and whatever works, then um, learn to tolerate failure, which is something that's going to happen and is natural. But you know the more pilots you can do, uh, the the, uh, the the more your chances of finding some successful projects. And then when you find those successes, you know, roll them out, define the, the KPIs. It's kind of you not know, basically what I was saying about startups, purely on an internal approach. Uh, have clear KPIs, manage the expectations, communicate clearly, and uh, manage this whole end-to-end -end innovation process uh, in that way. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's one way to for the whole, for the company as a whole, to learn to be more innovative and to to increase the culture of innovation within the company. You now you, you you learn by doing, so do it do it regularly, do it often, and uh, eventually you'll get there. Besides that, um, open innovation I think is extremely important to get access to new ideas, new ways of thinking, be it startups or other types of entities, and do regular benchmarking and trend spotting. Uh, kind of provoke the business areas by by showing you know what kind of what are new uh, the companies doing or new or, or existing companies that have a new way of thinking what are they doing and how could that be a threat to us uh, in the in the near future um, and, and and make sure that kind of information is disseminated within the within the company so I think if you do that you definitely boost your chances of success and and help the company itself to grow as an innovative company. We always say innovation isn't um, isn't invention. It's um, it's invention plus getting it done. So it's implementing things. There's the, any ideas that come up that aren't that are good ideas that aren't implemented, then you're not being innovative. You know, you have to you have to get things done. You have to make it happen. And you know, and to get, make things happen, you have to have a process in place. There's no two ways about it. Yeah, to be innovative, you've got to be able to deliver something at the end of it. But, you know, yeah. not every project will be 100% success. We understand that. It's yeah. about the business being involved, being prepared to learn, being prepared to listen, being prepared to try these things. And mm -hmm. a lot of that comes back from what your demands from your customers are and your engagement with your suppliers and what your staff want to do, et cetera. Exactly. exactly. Cool. Cool. Um, I mean, obviously, we are finding ourselves in a certain situation at this moment with COVID-19, mm -hmm. et cetera. But ignoring that, where, what kind of technology and innovation solutions do you believe are really critical and crucial to the facility service segment? Mm. Um, I mean, I, I, I can talk about the things that we've been looking at and, and yeah. in many cases implementing. Uh, and why we why we feel those technologies are, are important or can, can be important. Um, IoT, first of all, I think is unavoidable. Um, for example, in food safety, for vending machines, or we also have a lot of vending machines in maintenance and asset tracking, all those kind of things. Um, but it's IoT that should be affordable and it should be secure. I mean, there's, there's been a lot of talk about how IoT could make things hackable that weren't hackable before, and we have to, have to be very careful with that. The, 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 in the IoT, as, as someone said recently, IoT, the Internet of Things, the Internet is there, but sometimes the things take a while to catch up. Yeah. And, you know, the, the cost of retrofitting a whole lot of things for, for, for this kind of new technologies, sometimes it's just not, not viable. So we're looking at IoT, we're, we're implementing IoT, but selectively, selectively. 
Then um, one area that we've that we've been implementing quite a bit is computer vision. Now, computer vision um, in the area of security, for example, um, using com computer vision to automatically detect um, suspicious activity or intrusions or whatever it may be, is is a way to greatly increase efficiency in in security. So you don't need as many security guard or as many people looking at the, the, the CCTV cameras. You can you can have a computer do that and detect the situations and then pass on to the the people um, what it, the, the situations that you know that, that require attention. Computer computer vision is also implemented in the food area um, for detecting you know in, in a cafeteria the, the contents of um, of a tray for example what is the what is the customer what is the customer taking um, for payment for example. Um, robotics, obviously, is another technology in cleaning areas, warehouses. Um, it's, 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 it's something that also you need to be very selective because it can have very high investment involved. So you only want to implement robotics when, when, it's, when it's absolutely necessary and when there's a, there's a very good business case for it. Mm -hmm. uh, drones in security, drones in cleaning. Something that's uh, that's also that's also come up cleaning of facilities, um, and then I would say uh, I, I, I kind of avoid talking about AI and machine learning because it's it's so vague uh, that uh, it, you know it, it, it can be it can be anything. But I, I would say AI when it's applied and you're used in conjunction with any of these technologies that I just mentioned. Uh, like computer vision with algorithms, then that are that they use artificial intelligence and machine learning to to learn what a dangerous situation, for example, is in the CCTV. It, it, AI is absolutely crucial. Then we've got the whole area of um, mobile apps for the teams, the teams on the ground. We need to give them powerful mobile apps that uh, we need to eliminate all the the paper trail that's involved and make the processes uh, completely mobile and, uh, and much more uh, streamlined uh, that allied with a very robust uh, facilities management software obviously and then kind of um, another enabling technology for, for all of this is data analytics uh, capturing data and using this data to, to turn it into information for better decision making and to feed into the AI models and the machine learning and all that and they're, they're, they're the main technologies that have, in the past five years, we've been looking at piloting in some cases and, uh, and going ahead with. I mean, it's, it's great to hear because I, I think you're, as an organization, you're well ahead of the curve in that regard because a lot of people aren't anywhere near those sort of things at the moment. I understand what you're saying with IoT and AI, you know, a lot of it will come back to the business case for what you're doing, but then yeah. in other areas, as you're saying, bringing AI into the computer vision and into the kind of process automation element of detecting those security breaches and then using drones to inspect, et cetera, that's just, you know, that's mana from heaven as far as I'm concerned. That's really mm -hmm. excellent. Um, looking at where you are and where you're going and where we are in the current situation, We've got the need for isolation, the creation of new cleaning processes, for example. Where do you think holiday, um, technology is going to help us with those sort of elements? Uh, we're at a very, very strange crossroads at the moment. Uh, yes. I mean, we're, we're in a living through an unprecedented situation. And I, you know, at all levels, uh, and um, I mean, what, what, what's going on? What, what are where, where are our priorities right now? Cleaning and disinfection of facilities. That's you know, first and foremost, that's what that's what our customers need. That's what they need to reopen business, and they need to to get you know full disinfection. They need to have that kind of peace of mind that we're that we can do that, and that then we can keep it up. You know, it's not just cleaning for day one. To be reopen on day one, it's 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 that plus keeping it on a day to day basis, keeping keeping their people safe. What kind of technologies will be help? Will be using 
we were using to, to help with that. Um, UV machines. So those are all UVC lights that can uh, that can disinfect, uh, kill the, the coronavirus uh, in in rooms and in, in meeting rooms and hospitals and hospital rooms. Uh, that's that's something that we're that we're using. Also, perhaps we're also looking into allied with that allied with robotics, so that the machine can go through uh, without uh, and do it much quicker than would uh, otherwise be possible when you have to go in after you know, 10 minutes of disinfection, move the sh machine to another uh, place and then uh, another part of the room and, and then run it again. If you have a robot that can, that can help with that, that's, that's obviously a, a big efficiency gain. Um, we have, we're looking at drones for spraying large areas, for example, outside areas or inside areas, warehouses. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's also, I mean, that, so that that's kind of been the whole cleaning area. That's that's, that's what we've been looking at, and the, the kind of the demands we've been getting from from clients. Then access is control is going to be very important once everything gets going again. So we will need to, um, you know, recording body temperature technologies to automatically detect body temperature uh, in the the entrance or the entrance to the yeah. office buildings, for example. Um, the UV ones to to sterilize uh, you know small objects in in the uh, in the, uh, in the in, uh, as people are entering the building um, clean sterilizing their shoes using the UV to sterilize keyboards and door handles and stuff like that. Um, one thing that's also I mean I'm getting back to kind of to, to remote work and, and, and there's no doubt that remote work will has come and will now stay it's not going away again we're not going back to the pre-covid situation i think we're going to have kind of hybrid uh, situation where we'll have we'll have more people in remote work, remote work and we'll also have people in offices or people that spend part of their time in offices so this um presents particular challenges to, to, to many many of our services workplace health and safety for example uh, we have we we've started giving uh, courses in through e-learning and through Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever, so people can train about these about these issues at home, uh, and that's something that's that's going to stay. Uh, so you know we'll have to prepare a lot of these services that we provide for hybrid workforces, which is probably what we're going to have in the in the very near future. Um, I also mentioned when I was talking about status, um, el remote care for the elderly, and that's become even more critical after this. Uh, in this COVID situation, that's something that's definitely we're going to have to uh, have to accelerate. Um, and in general, I think that this has provided uh, this also provide this situation provides an opportunity to digitize customer relationships that were up until now, not digital. So, you know, providing apps, providing, making trans, taking transactions off paper and off and then face to face meetings and, and, and bringing them, bringing them online. That's something that's, that's definitely going to gain traction as well. I think there's, there's a lot of validity in what you say. We're going to automate a lot for thing, a lot more things and put apps and things like that in place, but we're also going to have to humanize the process as well <laughs> to rather uh, step too far away from each other take social distancing and uh, you know social distancing is such a weird phrase take the physical distancing that we're trying to do to protect people but actually be more social in the process become more engaged in that process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, i mean we're in a we're in the what people are now describing as the new normal because as you yeah. say there's going to be some hybrid out of it there is going to be more remote working. There are, you know, people have now established that they don't actually need to commute for an hour and a half to do 60 plus percent of their normal job. So mm -hmm. for some people, it's, it's really going to be a new normal. Um, thinking of that and therefore post this environment, the future, do you think there's going to be a need for solutions that have previously been disregarded or not fully utilized by now? Uh, at the moment that will need to be considered crucial in the future? Uh, I think that um, 
these kind this this these kind of solutions that I've been talking about were always there, but they were they weren't considered critical yeah. uh, up until now, um, or a lot of them weren't considered critical up to now. I think they I think they will they will be critical uh, or be considered critical from from now on. Um, this this the the whole idea and what you said is absolutely correct. We have we. This kind of business is a business, is a face-to-face -face business. Our people are in the client's premises uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, cleaning, providing security, running the cafeterias, uh, doing document management, whatever, workplace safety, health and safety, all these, all these kinds of business, all these kinds of activities. Um, so you know, we're used to a face-to-face -face, yeah. uh, contact and a face-to-face -face relationship. There's no doubt now that um, we have to accelerate uh, the part of the, uh, the, the part of the, or accept the part of this relationship can also be done without being face to face, right? There, there, there is a part of the customer relationship that's absolutely vital that it stays face to face. The, the, the kind of trust that you can only foster when you're when you sit down with somebody and you, you know talk about what, what their needs are and you talk about what what the problems are and all that. Um, but there's but there's a, there's a part of the relationship that can be digitized, it can be aut automated, it can be taken online, it can be put in apps, um, and you know I think the secret will be for us and for I believe for other companies in this area will be to find this, the right balance between this proximity and the automation part of the customer, of the, the customer and the end user relationship. Kevin, excellent. Couldn't agree more. I think there's a an opportunity to automate, to use the internet of things, to use other technologies in everything we do, but I don't believe it can replace everything we do. I do strongly feel that, that human interaction. Kevin, can I, say, can I say thank you very, very much for your time today? I no think at the moment, and in fact, I think we've overrun. So uh, I'm not sure we're in a position to do questions. I'm waiting for something to appear on my monitor to tell me if we are or not. But while they're doing that, I'll just come back and say that we will answer any questions that anybody submits after this session, if, if, if they come through afterwards. So please still reach out to us through our LinkedIn pages and just feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. Thank you. I don't think we're going to be able to do questions. No, we're not. Thank you, everyone, for joining and watching today. Thank you, Kevin, for joining me today. And just to say we'll be back next Thursday. We'll be doing a session about the hospitality industry and hotels. So please, anybody who's interested, go to our LinkedIn page, check their agenda. We'd really like to see you our next session. Once again, Kevin, thank you. Thank you, Larry. And I think that's going to be us out. One second, I'm waiting for somebody to say. Yes, that's us out. Okay. I think we're staying here for a moment, Kevin. I think we'll be. Okay. Hello. 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 I can't see anybody anymore. No. Wait. I can hear. Can you 